Well, as I mentioned this morning earlier, we have uh, two uh, fabulous keynote talks. Uh, the speaker we have now is uh, Dr. Professor Wen Mei Hu, um, local here on campus. Uh, Dr. Hu, or Wen Mei, may I call you, um, is um, a distinguished scientist uh, in computer engineering here at the University of Illinois Department of uh, uh, there's no department information there. So ECE, uh, Electrical Engin uh, and Computer Engineering Department, one of the best in the country or in the world. Uh, uh, Wenmei has a long distinguished career. Uh, he, um, he was uh, the department chair of the department uh, sometime last century. <laughs> uh, he's um, an endowed chair professor in the department and uh, He's probably well known for his uh, central contributions to computer architecture and parallel computing and associated uh, computational science. Um, he is uh, director of uh, the Universal Parallel Computing Research Center, co-funded by Intel and Microsoft. Uh, he's um, also a PI of the Blue Waters Supercomputer Project, funded by NSF, and he's. Uh, the director of uh, first ever NVIDIA CUDA Center. It's an industry funded research center uh, here on the Illinois campus. And he's uh, fellows of both IEEE and uh, ACM. Uh, so too many, uh, again, um, as in the case of uh, Mike, um, uh, accolades and honors to, um, to number here uh, to keep it short in the interest of time without uh, further ado. Thank you very much, Wumei. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I really uh, appreciate the opportunity to talk to this community about uh, some of the um, computational trends that we see as important, and uh, hopefully would we'll also give you some uh, overview of some of the resources that were coming your way in the next um, few years. Um, in general, um, the computing industry has been moving more and more into heterogeneous computing. And um, this is mostly because of the power uh, limitation of the hardware design. Uh, this is, uh, in many ways, an embarrassment of my own discipline. Uh, I'm a computer engineer, and um, you know, I specialize in designing computer architecture and uh, microprocessors and systems. And one of the failures we had in the past, uh, I would say, five to uh, 10 years, is that we fail to uh, provide a simpler programming environment for, uh, for the vast community. Our ability to deal with uh, power and heat has been uh, essentially failing. And then uh, uh, we had to expose more of the, uh, the complexities to the users. And in many ways, um, I do feel that, see it as a failure. But in other ways, there are uh, better ways of dealing with this kind of deficiency than others. And just like what Mike is saying, there are many, many ways you can deal with these things. And um, you know, we need to be careful about some of the choices that we make today so that we don't end up uh, complicating matters unnecessarily in the future. So I'll come back to this point uh, through my presentation. So in the heart of Blue Waters, and hopefully um, you would, uh, I think there's a tour uh, tomorrow to, uh, to the Blue Waters facility. And the uh, Blue Waters machine is, uh, is currently being brought up. The, uh, I believe the CPU uh, part of the machine, which is based on AMD Interlagos, uh, is mostly in place. And uh, we are uh, just ramping up our acceptance test and uh, towards uh, full acceptance of that part of the machine. And um, uh, it's based on a fairly advanced uh, microprocessor from AMD. I'm not going to bore you with all the technical details. But um, it's about uh, 157 gigaflops of uh, double precision performance and about 50 gigabytes of uh, uh, memory bandwidth. And so uh, you know, I would say, compared to any chip uh, in the past five years, this is definitely a very advanced, very uh, you know, uh, impressive chip. And um, um, the NVIDIA Kepler chip has not uh, been produced yet. This is the K110 chip. And um, uh, the del delivery date is set to be early September. So all um, we're going to, to have about 3,000 of these chips in the machine. And um, uh, each one is about one 
0.4 teraflops of double precision performance, about uh, 190 gigabytes per second uh, band memory bandwidth. And um, uh, so the combination of these two chips uh, should give us a, a, a fairly uh, advanced computing capability. And I'm going to you know, well, give you a little bit of sense of what, uh, what it's like. So uh, in this machine, uh, we're going to have the vast majority of the uh, nodes going to be the XE6 nodes. And these nodes will have two AMD Interlagos chips. And um, uh, it gives us 16, what we call the core modules. And in some literature, you will see 32 cores in that count. It's all a matter of how you count these things. But um, uh, from our point, point of view, there, there are going to be 16 core modules that give us full double precision floating point capability. And if you count it the other way, it's been more an integer-based uh, calculation. But for most of the scientific computing, we prefer to look at it from uh, the full, full floating point pipeline point of view. And uh, each node is going to have 64 gigabytes of memory. And when I compare this machine to other machines, you will probably uh, see that this machine is going to be probably one of the few machines in the world at this scale that have this level of memory size, uh, main memory per node. And um, uh, in terms of the core memory, amount of memory available per core, um, this machine is going to have, uh, in our way of counting, four uh, gigabytes per core. But um, most of the machines um, in the way that will be available in the uh, same time frame will have much less memory available. So this is something that, that will be interesting for people who want to use large amount of main memory for uh, data analysis and so on. And um, the Jiminy interconnect um, you know, is a, it's a fairly powerful interconnection network. Um, with about 9.6 gigabytes per second uh, direction. And for those of you who are familiar with InfiniBand and so on, uh, this is a very powerful interconnect. Unfortunately, this interconnect is much less powerful than the original design of Blue Waters based on the IBM machine. And we lost more than 10 times of uh, bandwidth when we switched from IBM architecture to Cray architecture. And it was not of our own choice. IBM decided that it was not profitable enough to build Blue Water's machine for the science community. With the econ economic recovery, it was much more profitable to sell the same hardware to the banking industry. And um, unfortunately, that's one of the choices that um, you know, what, um, many companies have to make today. So we have about uh, 22,000 Cray XE6 nodes and about 3,000 of these no um, additional nodes that will be where one of the uh, Interlagos chips is replaced by a, a, a uh, NVIDIA um, a Kepler chip. And this chip um, you know, well, gives quite a bit higher, about three times higher the floating point throughput, but it has less memory. That's one of the limitations that we, you know, well, we're working with uh, industry at this point. Most of these high throughput processors at, ironically have less mem main memory available on their, uh, to, um, to their immediate access. However, it does have much higher memory bandwidth. The way we configure this machine is that um, uh, most of the machine is going to, um, the machine is uh, uh, configured to be a 3D torus uh, network. And all the GPUs are actually in one of the corners of that torus. And uh, being in one of the corners maximizes the bandwidth available for communication across these uh, 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 high throughput nodes. And um, it's a little bit different for those of you who are familiar with Titan, um, the, for, uh, different from the Titan uh, configuration where the, um, the high throughput computing nodes are actually uh, spread across the machine where the uh, available bandwidth uh, is actually quite a bit lower. So uh, this is just a very quick uh, summary of the system view. Um, you know what? Uh, what we, we talked about so far is mostly in the uh, in the core of the machine where the, all the Interlago CPUs and the Kepler GPUs are. But outside um, outside that view, uh, just as important is the uh, the storage and the uh, archive and the uh, uh, wide area network. And in many in 
all measures this machine is uh, very impressive in terms of the bandwidth feeds and uh, speeds and feed available to the real use of this machine. So um, you know what? Uh, one of the things that um, you know we we uh, typically will look at is you know how this machine will compare to other machines that will be you know available to scientists you know uh, uh, in, on a contemporary basis. So um, uh, immediate comparison obvious is the uh, the Oak Ridge uh, Titan machine. And this machine, um, you know, uh, Blue Waters team and Titan team have been working together quite a bit. Uh, in fact, Titan gave us access to some of the, uh, their Fermi nodes, the, the previous generation GPU nodes for our, many of our, our benchmark test runs and uh, early uh, application porting. So uh, we have a lot of collaboration. But if you look at the two machines, uh, these two machines are designed with uh, quite a bit uh, different philosophy. Um, the, uh, um, Blue Waters machine is designed to be mostly a CPU node machine with about 3,000 nodes of GPUs and about 7.6 uh, uh, petaflops of uh, performance comes from the CPU nodes and then only about uh, 4.3 petaflops came from the GPUs. Um, Titan is really designed to be a fully equipped GPU machine. So uh, you know what, all the uh, nodes will have GPUs in there. And the peak performance is about twice of the uh, of, uh, Blue Waters. But if you look at the, um, the available uh, performance from uh, CPU versus GPU, by the vast majority of the, uh, the uh, floating point performance will be coming from the, uh, the GPUs. And one of the most important uh, you know, differences that uh, a user will experience is that if you look at the amount of main memory available in the machine, it's about um, you know, less than one half of the uh, main memory available on uh, Blue Waters. So in, in many cases, that's going to be this, uh, a deciding factor of uh, application usage of these machines. Um, you know what, uh, we, we, many of my colleagues in J Japan are involved in the K-computer, and that, uh, at this point, this uh, definitely their pride and joy. So uh, I visited uh, Fujitsu not too long ago and then uh, had a uh, little bit uh, you know, lively discussion about uh, how these machines relate. So this is a quick comparison of the Blue, uh, the blue Waters and, and the K machine. Um, the peak performance is almost identical. And um, the interesting fact is you know, this machine is um, uh, essentially based on all CPUs. And this is based on their, uh, the Fujitsu Spark chip. And um, you know, uh, it's uh, one of the, um, you know, the, the chips that they are very proud of. And um, uh, if you look at the amount of memory, it's almost identical. So in many ways, if you look at the, the practical science usage in the uh, main production mode, these two machines are going to actually have very, very similar uh, you know, usage. And, um, uh, but one of the uh, interesting differences is that um, uh, their interconnect is a six-dimensional torus, which will give them somewhat higher level of uh, performance. And then th this is something that, uh, you know, well, at some point, we're going to need to do some comparison and, um, you know, really have some practical experience with, um, you know, the extra, uh, the extra benefit that, um, you know, they can provide with the uh, higher dimensionality. Um, if we compare that with the Livermore uh, Sequoia machine, uh, this machine is based on the IBM uh, Blue Jeans Q uh, uh, technology, and um, uh, it's uh, it's a very impressive machine. It's uh, about twice the uh, peak performance of uh, Blue Waters, and um, uh, but the amount of memory is about the same. So um, you know what? Uh, there will be also some interesting trade-offs when you uh, use these uh, machines, but um, uh, this is one of the, uh, I would say, the, uh, the interesting um, comparisons between a, you know what, I would say this is probably the most state-of-the-art CPU-based machine uh, you know what, in the, uh, it, it available to the science community in the next, uh, I would say, three, four, uh, three to five years. So if we look at the landscape and look at you know, all these machines from the user's point of view, we believe that there are two uh, major intellectual challenges to, you know, to, to users today. Uh, one is um, how do the users scale applications to larger processor counts? And um, as Mike was saying, you know what, in, in many ways, speeding up a particular uh, you know, usage application is sometimes a, a harder case to make. 
then you know trying to uh, make a case for uh, making a uh, the compute capable of scaling uh, handling a much larger scale uh, model or in a, a particular model in a much more detailed manner so um, you know what in, uh, when we look at all these machines one of the biggest challenges is that uh, many scientific uh, algorithms actually uh, I would say fall short uh, when we come to very large processor count. And the second one is the effective use of uh, many core and accelerator components for high throughput, com uh, throughput computing. And um, that has to do with the fact that many of the libraries and uh, core algorithms that we use in these models tend to be non-scalable. If you look at uh, the most frequently used uh, solvers or uh, you know what uh, library functions from let's say Intel uh, the MKL math kernel library, many of these libraries actually don't have uh, scalable form. And uh, just take you know what uh, uh, I would say uh, you know what a tridiagonal solver that many scientific engineering community use. Uh, the Intel MKL version can handle a uh, you know a so, uh, many many systems. If you submit many systems of moderate size, um, that solver is very scalable. But if you have a small number of linear systems, um, each one is very large, that solver is non-scalable. So that's going to be the fundamental uh, limitation for you know uh, community to use these kind of processors. It's the GPUs today. It's also going to be the CPUs tomorrow. And you know what, we, we are facing this problem as a community. It's not just a, you know, a, a niche problem. It's actually a problem for everyone moving forward. In many cases, these problems actually interact. And I'm, I'm going to come to this point uh, very quickly. So um, we, in this chart, we show the uh, 26 science teams um, that will be getting on to Blue Waters uh, in the very near future. And there are eight, uh, eight more selected uh, more recently that we have not put in into this chart. So um, uh, you can, as you can see, there are many, many um, different science disciplines. And I would like to really encourage this community to, you know, to, to participate in this, you know, in, in this uh, very exciting uh, uh, area. And then, um, you know, if you look at the kind of computation that we uh, we need to support on this machine, um, you know, what the traditional uh, strength of most of these machines are dense matrix calculation. But um, you know, what, but when we look at the real usage of these all these applications, um, you know, what, we're seeing that unstructured uh, grids and um, uh, you know sparse matrix far outweigh the dense matrix. Part of the reason is when people go to much larger uh, models and much uh, more sophisticated models, they start to deviate from dense matrix into graphs, into sparse matrices, into unstructured meshes. And that is actually one of the major challenges for us when we try to you know, deploy multi-core uh, CPUs with long vector length and GPUs with very high threat count. In both cases, we, we face these major challenges. So in the current, um, you know, the current status, you know what, um, my personal uh, responsibility in Blue Waters mostly is in the area of helping the applications to really uh, scale up their uh, node level uh, scalability and um, uh, throughput. So we picked uh, eight of these uh, 26 uh, applications. And um, these eight uh, applications have historically had uh, quite a bit of uh, usage of high throughput computing in, in terms of GPUs and vector um, you know, usage. And so uh, these teams um, already have some good foundation. And then we actually have a 30 people task force from NVIDIA, from, uh, from uh, Cray, from NCSA, and from all the application teams working on getting production level science run uh, performance, scalable performance uh, on the uh, Blue Waters machine. So let me give you uh, kind of a, a quick uh, you know, summary of you know, the, the two ends of, um, of our uh, current status. NAMD is a um, is is a, a, a molecular dynamics software produced 
here at the University of Illinois. It's a Klaus Charlton's uh, team, and it's uh, you know, widely used. More than 200,000 users worldwide, registered users. And it's used all the way from um, laptops to supercomputers. Okay, so it's, it's a, you know, a, a very highly used uh, uh, application. And on Blue, for Blue Waters, we have been working closely with the team. And um, uh, we have been using Titan, um, you know, the, uh, our, our sister project in, uh, uh, in uh, uh, Oak Ridge to project what was going to happen uh, in terms of uh, scalability and performance on uh, Blue Waters. So today, when we use an XK node, which is uh, essentially a current generation GPU plus an Interlagos CPU compared to two Interlagos CPU fully utilized, um, uh, for 32 nodes, we're getting about two times performance. And um, uh, I think uh, pro uh, in the projection, we're projecting about three times. And this falls right into what, uh, you know, what Mike was saying. Uh, for a shift of technology, um, this is sort of the low end of the performance that we're seeing today, about three times. And um, uh, for uh, a larger scale, uh, you know, well, for 768 nodes, we're projecting only about 1.5. And this comes back to my earlier comment about the interaction between scaling a software to a larger number of uh, node count versus the scalability within the node to use a high throughput uh, uh, computing node. NAMD is currently limited by the particle mesh, uh, you know, the EWAT method uh, mode where all the nodes are exchanging data so that they can uh, have, a, you know, have a, uh, enough of the interaction to bring the entire simulation forward. And that particular method is a kind of an all-to-all -all communication, very similar to uh, the, uh, the global FFT computation, which is you, uh, highly used in the turbulence in the uh, fluid dynamics simulation uh, community. These two methods are probably the two um, you know, uh, top uh, challenges in terms of scalability in all the top machines in the world. So, um, you know what? Uh, in terms of these, we are uh, we're doing two things. One is we're uh, developing improvements um, to improve the uh, PME methods, imp improving the FFT methods, and the other one is to help the science community to develop new methods such, such as fast multipole methods, in order to be able to you know uh, to uh, to, to break this uh, particular bottleneck. And as uh, Mike was saying, I was sitting there and I was, you know what, uh, uh, listening to, you know, to, to Mike's talk. In fact, you know what, I, I know about you for many years, but you know, this is the first time I ever uh, able to, to hear you talk in person. Um, one of the things that I do want to caution this community is that divide and conquer still matters. And um, uh, we still need to be able to, you know, to, to control the amount of uh, interaction, even though the, the amount of interaction you're going to be able to have is going to be much better than past. But moving forward, we still need to be very, very sensitive about the amount of interaction these nodes need to, to make in order to make uh, progress in terms of the global model. Now, um, let me now go into a, a, a more positive realm of uh, you know, the performance, sort of the more positive end of the performance scale. The QCD community, the quantum chromal dynamics community, have formed a consortium very similar to your community here. It's called USQCD. And um, uh, that community is incredibly collaborative. So they have built a uh, library, uh, you know, a function uh, library, for a fundamental library for all the teams to use. Even though they all compete for funding, they all compete in many ways. But they are fundamentally collaborative in terms of the, the foundation for their community, which is a very healthy you know, situation. So uh, we're able to work with this community and then brought, uh, bring up the, uh, their CUDA library you know, for this machine. And um, uh, currently, we're seeing um, about projecting about 13.2 times with uh, the uh, XK7 nodes versus uh, a XE node. And um, uh, for a larger scale, we're seeing slight drop, but uh, somewhere around nine times um, in the uh, in, in the scaling curve. So um, you know, well, we are uh, this, these are the the kind of situations where we believe 
for the Blue Waters generation, the 3,000 nodes uh, design was actually correct. That is, you know what, uh, at, up to the next few years, we believe that the optimal scaling for high throughput nodes is right around 3,000 nodes. And uh, you know what, if you look at the, the scaling curve, uh, you know, we believe that for most of the science applications, uh, we are right on the sweet spot. So if we populated the entire machine with, let's say, uh, entire machine with, um, you know, GPU nodes, I, I personally believe that in the next two, three years, we will be underutilizing the machine, okay, for, for practical real science runs. Now, uh, going back to the, to this community a little bit, the, uh, the GIS community, you know what, um, you know what, I, I personally have been very fortunate to, you know, to, to be associated with, uh, you know, with Professor Wan's group here, and I, uh, you know, I, uh, I trained some of his grad students to be able to program these kind of machines. So uh, Yang Li was in my in my class, and in fact, I think all the all the grad students that uh, you know uh, who have been programming these machines were in my class in the past uh, two three year, uh, years, and these students are phenomenal. So uh, you know the the view shed analysis the uh, you know the uh, the flu uh, analysis based on uh, you know what uh, the tweet information, or you know what the disease uh, you know what uh, risk propagation you know what uh, simulation environment, um, all these are extremely uh, well fit for the kind of uh, computation model that we were uh, you know uh, I was talking about in the uh, Blue Waters uh, uh, model, and um, if you look at the kind of analysis that um, these experiments have been using. For example, uh, for this particular one, um, you know, they use uh, 324 compute nodes, and each node has 64 gigabytes of memory. And if you look at Blue Waters, uh, you know, every node has you know, what, 64 gigabytes of memory, but um, there are going to be more than 30,000 nodes, right? And um, um, if you, I really would like to encourage all the communities to begin to think about large data analysis. What happens if you can place all the data that you want, okay, all the data you want into the main memory of a machine like Blue Waters? You know, think about the ter the, the petabytes of global memory. Okay, these are DRAMs that you can place all at once. And what kind of analysis that you, you, you should be doing you know, with this, right? And also, what kind of analysis that you should be thinking about when you can have access to anywhere between your cell phone, which is going to be, have a you know, sub substantial amount of um, you know, computing power, all the way to something like Blue Waters. And you know what, what, when do you make that transition? How many of the experiments you want to do on your cell phone versus, you know, um, at some point, when do you bump it up to the next level to your laptop, to, the, to your desktop, to your clusters, to, to the blue waters, right? And I think, you know, well, one of the, you know, one of the um, phenomena that I have been observing across all the uh, user communities is that a lot of the usages of these machines currently are disconnected. You would you would use you know what, the laptops for certain things, and then uh, you would do the experiments totally different on a Blue Waters kind of machine. But in my mind, I think that what Mike was saying was exactly right. You know what? These things should be based on the questions that people need to ask, and then at some point, the level of experiment will get to so high that there should be a, a way to you know fairly painlessly transition those experiments to these other machines. And you know the infrastructure should be designed that way, rather than having the user to painstakingly design very different experiments on these different machines. So um, let me just kind of you know uh, quickly address a couple of the uh, common user uh, you know uh, questions about um, machines like Blue Waters. So um, you know uh, what? Uh, when will the machine be uh, be deployed? Um, we. We are planning on uh, doing acceptance benchmarking runs um, in September 2012, and this is probably going to last until November. And um, there are going to be various early science activities and then testing. So the earliest time that we project the machine will be available for production use is probably somewhat sometime in December 2012, and we're working hard to, to make that happen. 
And um, uh, so uh, most of the application teams, um, you know, using GPUs will be using CUDA. And um, uh, that's actually, uh, you know, not our choice. But uh, when we survey all our uh, uh, science teams, they told us that today, when they do um, any kind of GPU, high-performance computing-oriented GPU programming, they have been using CUDA. So uh, this year, we, we were having VS, uh, uh, virtual school of computational science engineering summer schools to bring up application team uh, expertise. We already had our, our uh, July summer school on the introduction to heterogeneous computing. And we're going to have a August uh, summer school on algorithm design for uh, many core chips. And we're also building various tools for broad application teams to use. So uh, if you look at the sort of the, um, the way that we're helping our, our application teams today, um, there is actually, you know, in, in terms of software development, um, there are really a very wide spectrum of uh, tool usage in terms of early software development versus late software development. Most of our teams are in their late stage. That is, they have a fairly mature application. If you look at NMD, it's a 10-year-old software. It's you know huge amount of uh, you know legacy code, and it's very very late stage in terms of concrete software structure and so on. So the the best we can do to help them is to uh, essentially help them to uh, give them some libraries and some basic tools, for example, to adjust their data layout. And um, um, many of their uh, internal data structures are structure of array, uh, array of structures. And most of these you know, highly vectorized machines require something similar to structure of, ar uh, array of, uh, structure of arrays. So uh, these things can be extremely tedious. So we have been providing libraries to do the conversion and then uh, some uh, tools to help them to refactor some of the code to be able to, you know, to, to reduce their pain. Whereas uh, industry-wise, uh, we are all pushing things a little bit uh, higher up. That is, when you are designing your software, uh, would you be able to describe your software more in terms of C++ object-oriented class you know, what, uh, orientation, or even Fortran, um, you know, a 2000 level kind of, you know, a more, um, you know, a more strongly typed uh, system with better uh, code generation support. So MXPA and GMAC are the kind of tools that help you to, you know, to elevate your level. And Microsoft just came up with C++ AMP interface, uh, work, working with uh, Microsoft to uh, produce a wider uh, implementation because C++ AMP is a fantastic C++ uh, extension to allow people to use, you know, what GPUs and so on, but it's only available on Windows. Microsoft would not give you a port for Linux. However, they are not object to a community to bring up a Linux implementation of C++ AMP. So there are a lot of these activities that we are, you know, what we're working on to give you a much more rational. Uh, interface rather than these, you know, what essentially uh, compartmentalized, high, uh, you know, siloed, uh, you know, what the programming interfaces that you currently face. So that's something that we we are well aware of, and we're trying to resolve. So, um, you know, what I'm not going to uh, go into too much more details, but um, uh, I want to say a few words about the software base that hopefully you are currently building. And I'm, I'm, I'm really hoping to, you know, to, to put a few things into your, your ears so that um, uh, we can, you know what, uh, maybe influence how you build software for the future. Um, personally, I, I'm never a fan of building your software for a particular architecture. I think in the long run, it's a losing proposition. And uh, we have seen all these architectures come and go. However, I do encourage you to build your software in terms of scalability. I really think that you need to build your software in terms of parallelism scalability, in terms of data size scalability. And data size scalability in computer science terms is uh, algorithm complexity. You know, how your algorithm, how, how your number, uh, how the operations in your algorithm scale with the size of your data. And the amount of parallelism you can, you can, you know, uh, uh, exploit in your data set. 
So it's all going to come down to uh, you know regularity in in uh, you know in all different angles. So for example, low balance. Okay, low balancing in your algorithm is going to be tremendously important in the future. And um, um, you know what? Well, um, the total amount of time to complete a parallel job is limited by the the threads that will take the longest to finish. Unfortunately, I believe. Your data set is going to be uh, among one of the, the 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 most problematic in terms of load balancing, because geographic data in my mind is intrinsically sparse, intrinsically un, you know uh, uh, non-uniform, and um, you know what? Uh, if you don't believe me, you know what? Uh, just look at the traffic pattern in Los Angeles compared to the traffic pattern in Champaign Urbana. I think many of you have been enjoying the lack of. You know what uh, traffic? I just came back from a week uh, visiting Los Angeles, and um, you know I had a fortunate experience of driving down to San Diego to visit, uh, you know, to make a visit from the LA, and um, you know I, I, I thoroughly enjoy the traffic. Okay, it's one of those things that I enjoy every ten years, and um, you know, <laughs> so. Um, so how do you regulate? Uh, how do you design your algorithms and your data in such a way that you can you can actually low balance? What what determine how you can you know what uh, scale your um, your applications to much more capable computing nodes as well as uh, much larger systems in the future? Global memory bandwidth. <coughs> this is. Bad news for everyone. You know, even though um, you know we, we very much like to give you this kind of picture where you want any memory data, you open up the floodgate, and then here comes the data. For every algorithm, real algorithm that I have dealt with, it really feels this way. Okay, you you want all that water, and you you kind of you, you try to get it through that uh, that straw. There's just you know every algorithm feels that way. So um, you know what, um, right from the beginning. You should be thinking about your data bandwidth. Okay, really, um, uh, size is not going to be too much a problem. But, uh, we're going to be able to scale in size. But how do you, you know, get your uh, your data into your compute uh, units is going to be the fundamental limitation all over. Conflicting data access patterns. You know what? Um, you know, most of you probably learn parallel programming by. You know what? Uh, saying okay, I have these uh, computing uh, uh, activities, and they're all going to be act updating some kind of data. So I'm going to just put some kind of atomic operations, some critical sections, and then I'm going uh, I'm going to have all these parallelism going. It turns out that uh, for most of the uh, the high throughput computing and uh, large scale computing, that paradigm just simply doesn't scale. Okay. So you know you you you're going to essentially have you know, a huge number of these parallel entities. You know, we're all very, very parallel entities, and we all lined up in front of the airport security or in front of the uh, Disneyland uh, rides. And why? Why are these people all lined up? They're all parallel. They're all fundamentally thinking parallel because if there's a critical section, okay, in each of these uh, in these areas. So when you think about your algorithms, you really need to think about. You know how do you fundamentally allow many, many, many entities to update your their data? How do you privatize them? How do you, you know, what uh, do the owner compute rules? And those are the kind of thinking that you need to put into your pro your models. And you know what? Don't really worry too much about vectorization and so on. You know, in the lower level, those tools will be there. Those tools will be will, will, libraries and so on will be there to, to to help you out. But unless you design your computational methods, paying attention to these three kinds of issues, you know, you're not going to be, um, you know, you're not going to be able to make it. So uh, scalable software development is really a Huge undertaking. There's no no question about that. You know what? Well, it's hard. It, uh, thinking about your computation, thinking about your data in a way that um, you know your model will be scalable, is you know a minimum of three months of work for each job that you do. So it in many ways it feels like you know you're pushing it, you know pushing that car into the junkyard or something. It just it takes forever, you know, to to do this. However. I really think that um, you know if we do it right, 
this can be one of the major gifts that we are giving to the future community. If we can make our data model and our, our compute model scalable, it's going to be probably the, the best legacy that we can give in terms of computing to the future generations. Because it's not just a two times, three times performance enhancement on Blue Water's machine. It's going to be the continuous scaling of you know, performance, model size, and model depths for many, many generations to come. And in many ways, in the past 20 years, companies like Intel and AMD persuaded all of us not to do this kind of work by giving us free lunch, right? Every generation, the processor runs faster, and you don't need to touch your software base, which is a great vision. But that particular, every stretch has a limitation. Every stretch ends, and that stretch ended. If we make our software tool and software base scalable, we can have another stretch, another stretch of perhaps 20 years. Okay, And that's where we really want to be. And we don't want our grad students, our grand grad students, to have to work on models that just don't scale. Okay, And uh, they're going to blame us for social security problems and software scalability problems. <laughs> Both start with the S. Okay? Now, um, I think we, uh, I'm running out of time, so I, I'd rather not uh, run over time, but uh, you know, have time for you to ask some questions. So I would like to make a uh, just quick advertisement. So um, you know, every summer, we have two summer schools. Uh, the first summer school is an uh, introductory summer school on um, how to program uh, you know, uh, heterogeneous computing um, you know, uh, systems. And we already had a summer school in July uh, 10th through 13th. But all the material, all the lectures are available to, you know, uh, to whoever interested in that uh, particular school. And um, the second school is upcoming. It's uh, you know, August 13th through 17th. And this is proven algorithm techniques for many core processors. And this is a summer school where we, we uh, address the low balancing problem, the, um, you know, the uh, memory bandwidth problems, the, um, you know, the uh, uh, update conflict problems. And we actually teach, teach them in a practical way so that um, the students actually end up doing uh, MPI, joint MPI and CUDA programming to you know, uh, using a, a couple of the tools to make things uh, easier for them, and uh, so by the end of the week, they have a really good overview of you know what these problems are. And if they wanted to, they can take another um, you know semester long course to to really flesh it out. And I think Zhao Wen's students all have taken both types of some semester courses um, in the uh, past two years. And um, uh, for those of you who like to have fashionable things. Um, Illinois joined Coursera, and um, you know, so it's one of the uh, free course movements uh, in, uh, on the web. So uh, uh, one of the Illinois courses that we offer on the, um, through Coursera is um, you know, uh, uh, program, uh, heterogeneous parallel programming. It's an eight-week course. It's right in between a summer school and a uh, semester's course. Uh, course. But it's on the lighter side because everything's automated. Okay, so all the grading, all the homeworks, and uh, everything is automated. So obviously, we cannot go too deep into the material. But if your students are interested in this asynchronous kind of, you know, a low commitment and uh, you know exposure to some of these techniques and uh, you know, what uh, uh, um, uh, methods, um, that course is available. Current, I think the current registration count is about 6,000 students. And it's very interesting for those of you who teach, you know, who teach in the universities. This is the first time I taught a course with uh, more than 6,000 students okay, in one semester. So it's going to be very interesting. And, and I, I, I'm one of those old timers who would like to know, get to know personally all, every student I teach. In fact, I think I, I take pride in knowing all the students that come to my class, including all the geography students, right? But uh, it will be a very interesting challenge for me to remember the names of all the 6,000 students that I'll be teaching in fall. So thank you very much for paying attention to me. And I hope that I put a couple of ideas into your, your, your mind. And uh, hopefully, you know what, we will see you on Blue Waters and all these uh, future machines to come. Thank you.
<laughs> Thank you, Xiaowen, as always. <laughs> Given the two designs between Titan and Blue Waters, and we see the, the difference there is really in the GPUs, characterize the difference in the problem sets. Yeah. So we saw a list of problems for Blue Waters. We actually had the opportunity to visit uh, Oak Ridge last year and, and talk. But can you characterize the difference in the problems that leads to the difference in the designs? I suspect it's the difference in problems yes. that leads to the yeah. difference in design. Yes. OK. Uh, very good. So um, you know what? Uh, obviously, um, it's a balance issue. You know what? Uh, there's no fundamental difference in terms of philosophy. It's really you know what, how far you go in terms of building a uh, a production machine with the number of GPUs that uh, we feel will be you know what really used by the science community. So uh, today, uh, you know, I'm I'm in in a spot where I see a large number of applications at different stages of using you know these kind of you know GPUs. In fact, um, it's not just the GPUs. It's really any machine with very long vectors, if, if, if you look at it that way, and the high memory bandwidth. Okay, so the, it's really those two that characterize it. So whether it's the next generation CPU or M MIC you know, uh, uh, from, from Intel and so on. And so far, most of the applications can you know, have more than two times to three times performance scale of, uh, you know, uh, uh, advantage using these nodes up to about 1,000 nodes. Okay, I'm not saying that, that that will continue to be the case in the future. And in fact, in many ways, we're working very hard trying to change that. We're trying to make, make it into 10,000, make it into 20,000, right? So if you look at the, um, the Titan design versus Blue Water's design, we have 3,000 nodes with, with GPUs. And Titan has about 10,000, okay? And you know what, so my, my suspicion is that you know what? In the next two years, most of the, uh, the the applications running on Titan will struggle because you know what? The, the algorithms and the kind of you know what implementation of data sets that I know will not be able to scale to ten thousand and get substantial benefit in terms of the the, the GPU, the real GPU uh, advantage. Okay. However, that machine is more forward looking. And in many ways, I'm going to refer some of the best performance of the Blue Waters machine to Titan, right? And you know what? So that's why I kept referring to this uh, the project as sister projects. So you know what? Uh, we are going to need to work together to you know to help everyone to make that transition. In ten years, there's no choice anymore. All the nodes are going to be at least as high throughput and bandwidth as the, the GPU nodes that we have in the machine. More questions? Brad? No show of hands. <laughs> I'd like to um, relate your talk to um, Professor Goodchild's four uh, points on what would we do if we had infinite resources. And oh, I so there is show of hands any, uh, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> um, the, the f and, and I can't quote exactly how he phrased them, but the first one was um, using more data, which is a throughput problem. The second one was making the models more realistic. Um, the, the th and those two are convincing Washington that we need bigger resources. The third one was better software, and the fourth one was making it user friendly. And those are questions of training people and being creative and having imagination for what we want to do. Right. How are we doing that? Yes. OK. So um, it's, it's, I think that that's a broader question than I was uh, intending to present here. But I'm very happy to answer that question. If you look at the way we design Blue Waters or you know, any of these kind of sister machines, um, the, I would say probably the highest priority is today is actually to help people to run bigger models. Okay. If you look at climate, if you look at, you know, combustion, if you look at, you know, what, um, you know, the biology and so on, mo in reality, we're not speeding up existing models, per se. 
Okay, everyone knows that um, you know existing models, speeding up existing models is strong scaling. It's hard. It's very you know what expensive, and it's usually not very cost effective. But most of these teams are trying to run bigger models, finer grids in the climate prediction, and so on. So that goes to sort of your your first point. In reality, these machines are probably focusing on that that first point. Being able to get bigger model, getting more deeper and more realistic model is everyone's dream, but it's fundamentally much much harder than the first one. Okay, and um, you know what? I hope I'm not being recorded, right? So, uh, <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Okay, uh, let's skip to the. <laughs> But <laughs> algorithm-wise, deeper models are always much more difficult to low balance to be able to you know the, to um, to avoid conflicts. Okay, every model that I've seen in the deeper way, you know what, mostly in the in the uh, fluid dynamics you know world, you know what, when, as soon as we get into these more realistic models, it's always much much harder to scale. Okay, and on the other hand, you know what. Progress are being made, but it's probably not going to be in time for this generation. We're probably talking about five, ten years of minimal of effort to get us to where we really need to be. So it, you know, it is an investment that we did not make in the past twenty years, and now we re we're paying for it. Okay. Now going to your third and fourth question, um, I don't think those thing um, those questions are going to be answered at all. With <coughs> blue water's kind of machine, but there are some very good progress at the uh, I would say at the, the desktop level and the mobile level, because um, you know what one of the things that um, you know what um, I would say at the desktop level is that machine learning algorithms and data you know sort of uh, very um, high throughput, low latency data classification kind of algorithms are actually making really good progress. Um, you know what? It, in the consumer world, so you know what? One of the things that I, I believe, you know, the science community need to do in the, um, I would say, in the next few years, is really to benefit from the, you know, the um, some of the breakthroughs that people are making in the consumer world in terms of computer vision, in terms of, you know, what uh, uh, data, sort of the cloud level, uh, you know, what um, analytics that people are building, and these things are really. Becoming you know extremely powerful, but I part of the problem is these things are not free, <laughs> and uh, you know the science community like free things. Okay, well, I like free things. Okay, <laughs> I, I I don't never want to pay a penny if I can get it for free, right? But um, the reality is many of these good collaboration you know data classification tools are not free. So it is something that, as a com you know, community, we need to figure out. You know, what would be the right model of engagement to really take advantage of those? And many of those really use high throughput computing and so on. So you know, it, it's it's a very good use case for these things, but um, but it's just something that you know, from the science uh, uh, perspective, you know, it's not clear exactly how we're going to take advantage of those of those capabilities. Thanks very much, Wenli, for the very uh, stimulating talk. Uh, if I may add one more question, I think you had an alarming message for our community, which is uh, in 20 years we have to worry about uh, both scalability and uh, social security. Uh, so uh, related to that, uh, my question is, um, you know, in the past 20 years, uh, the mainstream computer architecture and the uh, high-performance computer architecture, which were basically separated. Now with Morse law and everything, there seems to be converging. Mm -hmm. uh, I suppose that was your rationale to make that alarming uh, message. Uh, so I was curious if you could elaborate more on if we don't take any actions, because in GIS world, we know that uh, fundamentally our algorithms are not scalable. Uh, we benefit a lot from our legacy uh, research. Uh, so if we don't take any actions, what are the dark side you might see? 
Yeah, so uh, you know what? I think it's all going to be about uh, you know what actions to take and what actions not to take, right? Um, you know what? I would really not uh, want all the you know all the GIS researchers go and hand vectorize your library code. Okay, it, it, it's one of those things that um, I don't. I really don't believe that um, if, if you do the hand tuning of you know of things on the GPU and then publish a paper with you know two times performance or something, I, I don't think it's a productive use of a domain expert you know research time. However, um, I really believe that um, when you design your models, when you design, you know what, when, when you start to think about how you model, let's say, you know what, um, uh, your um, just, you know, the, um, the, the um, I would say the agents and then, you know, how the uh, uh, agents interact and how these, you know, what, uh, uh, disease spread, for example, you need to start to think about these things more in terms of general embody problems that uh, there are many, many different types of you know, algorithms that you, know, you can have locality, you can have more scalability, you can have more privatized way of doing things and still give you the, you know, the, the kind of scientific results that you need. So you know, those are the kind of uh, activities that I really believe that you, you need to start to pay attention today, if not 10 years ago, right? And if we don't pay attention to those kind of problems, we are not being responsible for our grand, uh, you know, uh, grad students, our great grand students, and so on. So you know what, we, you know, that's where I really want, to, want you to, to spend time thinking about. And you know what, the consequence is that you know what, really nothing for us, but you know what, your poor grad students and grass, uh, great, uh, uh, you know, great, uh, uh, grass, grass students are going to essentially say, you know, I wish that Professor Wang would have done his model this way rather than that way. Now I have to spend another three, four years before I can make progress because we're all stuck, right? And that's not a good thing for a community, okay? In the interest of time, uh, we do need to wrap up. Let's uh, thank both speakers of the session again. Thank you. Thank you.